My name is Camilla Frank Thompson, and I'm application marketing manager for desalination for applications within the marine and offshore. And today I will be uh, talking about uh, how you use uh, seawater versus osmosis in the in the process of delousing salmon. Within desalination, we have split the market, so we both supply to land-based facilities that can be hotels and resorts, uh, etc. We also uh, supply pumps and energy recovery devices for the marine and offshore industries, uh, for offshore platforms or different kinds of, of commercial vessels. And we also supply to mobile applications. Um, but today what we will focus on is, is the marine and offshore part. And uh, more precisely, it will be about uh, how desalination is used within the aquaculture industry. Yes, so let's let's kick up and uh, kick off the topic for for today. So, salmon farming or salmon aquaculture is a, is a growing industry that is driven by global world population growth. It's also driven by increasing consumer wealth, changing habits uh, in dietary preferences, uh, etc. Today, uh, fish is actually the the fastest growing animal-based food group, and more of the fish that we buy in the supermarkets and, and eat uh, comes from uh, farmed areas. A typical life of uh, a farmed salmon, it, uh, it starts in the land-based hatcheries where the fish begin their life. Uh, after growing to, to a certain size, uh, the fish are then um, typically transported to these uh, open net pens that are located in, in coastal areas. Uh, here, they will have a, a free flow of seawater that can enter the uh, net pens, which creates a, a natural environment for, for the salmon. But of course, it also allows other organisms and, and parasites to, to enter these uh, open net pens. One of these parasites is called the sea lice, and this parasite is particularly harmful for a salmon as it can result in, in fish injury, um, uh, diseases, um, or in, in worst cases, uh, mortality. So yeah, treating sea lice is of course an, an ongoing challenge for salmon farmers all around the world. But luckily there are many, uh, many ways to treat sea lice. For many years, chemical treatment has been the preferred and, and main a method to to treat uh, sea lice, and though it is it is a very effective uh, method, it also comes with other challenges. For example, chemical resistance or also environmental concern. So there are also more sustainable um, sustainable ways of of treating sea lice. For example, uh, you can treat them by thermal treatment, or uh, another possibility would be to to flush the salmon using this uh, low pressure water jets and though both are also very uh, efficient uh, methods they can also cause fish injury or um, yeah in worst cases cause mortality so therefore today we are focusing on another more innovative and, and gentle solution to uh, to treating sea lice and, and delouse the salmon which is the um, freshwater treatment by using freshwater treatment, uh, salmon are temporarily um, removed from the, the net pens uh, they, are, they are in out in, in the open water and uh, bathed in this uh, freshwater bath. It is so that, that sea lice, they cannot survive in, in low salinity water. And therefore, by getting the salmon into the freshwater bath, the sea lice will, uh, will detach from, from the salmon. This mimics the, the natural process um, where wild salmon uh, swim up the streams to spawn and in that process also shed all the, the lice they have. So by treating uh, sea lice in this way, we are trying to, to mimic uh, the, the natural process of how it happens in, in the wild. I also want to say that the freshwater treatment uh, has no, no harmful impact on, on salmon, uh, but also on, on the non-target species that can also be, uh, yeah, be pumped into to the freshwater bath. We have here made a small drawing of, um, of how it works. Um, so what, uh, what you do is you have these uh, special kind of uh, vessels, as you see here on the picture, called uh, well boats. These well boats are equipped with a desalination plant. Uh, a desalination plant is where you use, uh, where you pump high uh, water with high pressure through a, a membrane, and um, 
thereby produce fresh water. So you have two outputs. You have the, the brine output with the higher concentrate uh, salinity, and, and you have the output, which is what you, you need here with the fresh water uh, order permit. So as you can see in the picture, what you do is you uh, you pump seawater into the well boat's desalination plant. Uh, you are underwater, so of course you have a lot of uh, seawater ready available to you. In the desalination plant, the fresh water is produced by this process um, I just described, which is called reverse osmosis, which is uh, pumped into to the well of the boat. Here you have this uh, large freshwater bath, uh, we have called it here on the picture, and then you you pump the salmon from the open net pens out in the water into this, uh, into this uh, where the fish are then in, in the fresh water. And as the sea lice cannot survive in, in low salinity uh, water, uh, they will therefore detach uh, from the salmon. And then after the salmon are treated, you are able to to pump them back into the open net pen to be there for the for the rest of the grow out period, and in this way you are able to sustainably treat the treat the salmon without the use of any kind of chemicals. And I think with this picture in mind, uh, I actually would like to hand over to my colleague uh, Miguel, who will share a, a real case story from a customer who did the who did exactly this. So thanks, Camila. I'm Miguel Gomez from Sales, located in Spain. I will be introducing this case for you. This is, uh, on that time, was the world's largest world boat, designed specifically for salmon aquaculture. The, it looks small in the picture, but it's real big. <laughs> it's around 84 meters length and 30 meters wide. So it's a big piece of engineering of a boat, only fully dedicated only for uh, aquaculture, so it's a big business in deep. Um, it has been supplied with a uh, arrow plant designed and manufactured by our custom Quantum, located in Galicia, Spain. So let's get on board this ship with me. What has been installed on board? It, uh, our customer Quantum has uh, a manufacturer design installed for them a 5,000 cubic meters a day plant made with Danfoss, high pressure pumps, energy recovery devices, and drives. The plant is uh, made with four high pressure pumps, four APP65, and four energy recovery devices, four ICF sanities. The plant is divided in two trains just um, to facilitate performance. Look at this uh, piece of art of engineering our customer Quantum has made on board this ship because uh, space is always important, but it is even more important on board a ship. A space is uh, very limited, and as most of you know, as I guess that you are related to the salination industry, you know that the salination plants get a lot of space. So. As a space is one of the critical points on aspects on the, uh, onboard a ship, by using our pumps and energy recovery devices, they are having the most compact system in the market. And it's not even only the most compact system, it's also the most efficiency system. When we are talking about desalination, we are always talking about a high consumer system. Uh, so we talk about electricity price. On board a ship, there is no energy supply. The energy supply, the energy is produced by a diesel engine. So the most efficient is the system, the less diesel is consumed. So it's a pretty important aspect to have in mind. So by using the most energy efficiency system in the market, the end user is saving tons of uh, money at the end of the year or liters of diesel. Talking about desalination, when we talk about land-based desalination, uh, operation conditions are important. But operation conditions are even more important when we are talking about a ship. Ships are moving around. Sea water temperature uh, is different on, uh, during the year. And as the ship is moving around, the salinity is also different depending on how far from the shore is the ship. So by using our pumps and ice ships that are 
volumetric systems, as my colleague Kevin will introduce you the technology le later on, uh, you will see that this system can adapt to any operation condition. It doesn't matter if uh, the temperature goes or the seawater goes 10 degrees higher, 10 degrees lower, if they need to increase recovery, decrease recovery. Our customer Quantum has manufactured and designed this system just to adapt to any operation condition just by pushing one button. So very nice job uh, by, uh, did by them. Thank you, Camila. I, now I will let you continue with my colleague Kevin talking about the technology. Thank you, Miguel. We have these uh, high efficient uh, axial piston pumps uh, we call APP pumps. These are based on the positive displacement pump concept. And uh, they are available in different sizes coming from flows from 0 0.15 and all the, way, all the way up to 92 cubic meters per hour. The typical uh, uh, pressure that we operate is, is in the, the range of uh, 20, 30 bars and up to 83 bars. Uh, the materials that we are using is uh, all super duplex uh, or duplex steel, depending on what applications we are going into. The pumps are designed in a way that you can put as many of them in parallel as you wish. Uh, that's the beauty about these uh, positive displacement pumps, that they are not really affected by each other. So when you put them in parallel, you can mix them as you wish uh, to obtain the flow that you need. So uh, the, the beauty about positive displacement pump is as well that uh, they are very efficient. This is, of course, impacting the, the, the OPEX uh, for the users. Uh, as these pumps have the lowest energy consumption, there will be a significant savings when using them compared to other technologies. With the APP pumps, you get the efficiency rates up to 92%, which is uh, yeah, up to 16% better than other uh, pump technologies in, on the market. The positive displacement pumps are uh, controlling their flow through the RPMs of the motors, that uh, the efficiency is constant no matter um, what RPMs you operate at, you will have the proportion uh, flow um, versus RPMs coming out of the pump. So the efficiency stays the same no matter if you operate at low uh, pressure or high pressure. It doesn't really affect the pump as such. So uh, because the, the pumps is uh, rotating at a fairly, they, they rotate up to 1800 RPMs and they are very small in the footprint uh, because of this concept of having a cylinder barrel uh, rotating. They take up very little space uh, and because of the sizes, it's, it fits everywhere and can be placed both horizontally and vertically. That makes them easy to service. Handling of the pumps in my remote areas is very easy. There's no need for heavy lifting equipment. And like Miguel was saying, when you get on board on a ship where space is limited, these pumps are really uh, very easy to, to find space for and uh, get installed. The RPMs, as I said, was uh, proportional to the flow. So if you are adjusting or need to adjust your flow on your membranes, you either speed them up or if you want to reduce, you speed them down and the, pro the flow will change accordingly. And again, you can do this independent. If you have more pumps in parallel, you can have uh, maybe two or three of them running uh, direct online and then just have one pump operating uh, with a frequency drive on and do all of the, the fine tuning on that uh, specific pump. They are, the APP pumps, they offer, very, they offer easy and predictable operation. They are increasing the reliability and reducing the OPEX. And this is due to the, the full control of the life cycle cost and the service intervals that uh, is needed for them. We uh, are specifying for each, um, all the wear parts have specified the service life, and we are able to, to control the cost on the service uh, due to this. There's no oil in the pump, so you don't have to change any oils, and there's no lubrication needed besides what you get from the, the fluided pumps. And there, there's therefore also no risk of uh, contamination of the water that you're pumping. There's no special alignment needed. Uh, all the pumps are mounted with a fixed bell housing. And uh, this basically means that uh, when you install the pumps or do service on your pumps and you, you take them off the electric motors, there's no uh, really uh, risk of error as the motors will always be aligned uh, perfectly by the, the fixed bell housing. And they are easy to install because of uh, everything is set up from the start. Besides the pumps, we also have these uh, the eye safes. 
uh, EADs. They are built on the isobaric pressure exchanger concept. The eye safes are uh, coming in different variances or sizes, just like the pumps. We have the iSafe 21, that is um, the smallest one we have, that comes 6 to 22 cubic meters. And we have them all the way up to the iSafe 70. We also have our MPE 70, which is a pressure exchanger concept that is uh, more used into bigger RO systems. The iSafe is a, a, a unit that is uh, consisting of, um, of uh, both the weight pump or booster pump and also the pressure exchanger. The pressure rating of these are, uh, they are operating up to a pressure of 83 bars. And it's basically utilizing the same technology as on the, um, on the wear parts as we use in our axial piston pumps. So some of the valve systems and so on is coming from that technology, which Danfoss have been mastered for the last 20 years. The materials is uh, super duplex and duplex steel, which is um, yeah combined with these uh, carbon fiber reinforced thermoplastics. So for the installations, uh, they are just like the APP pumps, very small due to the, the, the technology. We are using a cylinder barrel uh, to, to, um, to, to, to the exchanger, and we are using a weight pump for the booster pump. This makes it very compact. And uh, as we have combined all these uh, components into, uh, into one device, when we say it's a three in one, you can say it's because we have the pressure exchanger. We have a positive displacement pump, which is the weight pump uh, that is used for a booster pump, which is uh, because it's a positive displacement pump, it also works as a flow meter. Because basically, if you know the RPMs on the iSafe, then you also know what flow you're getting out of it uh, on the high pressure side. It's very compact in design, and it's allowing, uh, which allows it to produce more water in less space with uh, less complexity. And the iSafes can be placed in both vertical and horizontal position, um, which makes it easy to install. Uh, you know, it's easy to, to, to handle it in the field as well, as they are not heavy uh, in the same way as, as other components uh, or similar components. Then um, for the iSafe ideas, they have a, offer a high energy efficiency just like the XL piston pumps, you know, this is a mantra for Danfoss. We want to have the most efficient technologies in our portfolio. The exchanger and uh, the, the, the iSafes is having an efficiency up to 92%. Uh, and this is including the high pressure booster pump. The isobaric pressure exchanger is known as, as you know, the technology is known to be the, the most energy efficient technology on the market. And we're typically offering up to 30% lower energy consumption than other EAD uh, technologies. The, the control of the ISAF makes it easy to optimize your system. system. Uh, all the ISAFs are controlled with a VFD. And uh, the VFD will allow you to control the flow on the high pressure side independently of the flows on the low pressure side. And, and thereby, you know, you are in charge of this, uh, this application or the installation, uh, 100% once it's installed. The iSafe EADs are designed for automatic and fail-safe operation. Basically, the drive will monitor the iSafe and make sure that everything is in order. The rotor is spinning, uh, or the rotor spin is controlled by the, the drive, which uh, eliminates any risk of overspinning or overflowing during uh, commissioning, startups, and during operation. That means you get a very reliable and low maintenance performing uh, EAD and uh, it makes it also easy to fault find on it because you know exactly where your EAD is, uh, how it operates, how much it's, how much flow you get out of it, how much you should get out of it, and uh, what the the speed is of the of the device. Yeah, I guess that's all we had for for the for the ISA from the actual piston pumps, and then uh, we are ready to, for some questions.